welcome to the fifth episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast. Uh, thank you guys again for joining us. Uh, I'm, we are your co-hosts, John Shipley and uh, Traven. Treve, uh, go ahead and uh, give the people a shout out. What's going on, everybody? We are all here living in chronic depression, but we're hoping that the Jaguar Maven podcast can boost your spirits because when we have depression, we decide to uplift and be positive people. Yeah, I, I, she goes. Yeah, I mean, when 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 you watch games like uh, Sunday, you know, it, it can definitely be hard for people to uh, be optimistic, especially you know when it comes to the Jaguars. And I think that reflects in a lot of fans' mood uh, right now about the team. Like, you know, we we kind of honestly have seen the mood, you know, shift from optimism uh, over to anger in those first couple games after Minshew was benched to apathy and now it now it's just like sad and emotionless you know what i mean i honestly don't think like usually for most drag seasons like yeah for the fans it's very consistent feelings like in 2017 it was like the only season where it was consistently like oh this might be good but like in the 2013s the gus bradley eras and all that you know it's consistent sadness i think like this year has been the biggest emotional roller coaster yeah yeah i'd agree with that yeah, I, I I'd agree with that because a lot of the like the Gus years, like there was one year under Gus where I think they were two and three or two and four, and that was literally the high point of his tenure because they had won yeah. like they beat the Colts uh, in London, they had won one other game, and they they weren't quite at five hundred, but they were almost at five hundred. It was the closest they'd ever been to five hundred under Gus after the first few weeks. And people were pretty excited then. But it, it was nothing like, you know, the, the Minshew Mania stuff and all that. And it, 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 it's just hard to believe this was a 4-4 four and four team like a month and a half ago. It's, it's hard to believe that there was just so much optimism and excitement, like, inside this building. And, you know, not a lot of people talk about it, but I wonder how much of the way this team has gone is, like, directly reflected on – Gardner Minshew not playing and I know I'm a big Gardner Minshew stand you know I stand for him all the time but you know I, I always think like wh- how would this season go would it go any differently would it still be this depressing if Gardner you know stuck his neck out and played like the rest of the season I, I mean it I think it hinges on uh, you know, the actual uh, end results and how he plays because, I mean, everybody was, you know, semi-excited to see him this Sunday, and then he goes out there, throws 37 passes for less than 170 yards, and they lose, uh, by, 30, was... they, and they lose by 35. So, yeah, you know, it was nice to see Gardner again, but at the end of the day, they still weren't even close to competitive somehow. So I feel like a lot of fans, like, it, it was like a quick Band-Aid solution, you know, putting Minchu back yeah. in there. Like, it picked up morale a little bit. And then once the game actually got going and they went down by a couple of touchdowns, e- even even the excitement of Minshew being back, I feel like, couldn't really well, it, spirits. It just seemed like they were just limiting, like, Minshew. I don't know if that's, that's Minshew, you know, throwing all those check downs. But, like, there was just, like – Yeah. And, obviously, the Chargers' pass defense came in, like, second in the league. So, I mean, that's a good pass defense. But oh, yeah. just – not taking any shots whatsoever. Everything was just short and underneath. I don't know. It was it was definitely a boring game to watch. Uh, I yeah. watched it with some of my friends, and literally they all wanted to switch the game, and two of them <laughs> ended up falling asleep. So, <laughs> Dude, If anybody was watching that game and wasn't a Jaguar Wars fan or having something to do with the Jaguars, like writing about the Jaguars, reporting on them, whatever, I have serious concerns <laughs> for, for their interest because – Goodness, that that was – you know, we'll start off the show with this topic. We we talked about this beforehand. Uh, you know, of course, the Jaguars lost 45-10 to 10 to the Chargers on Sunday. Uh, it, it was not even close really at any point. Uh, the Jaguars had a pretty nice opening drive of 14 plays, four first downs, uh, 68 yards, and they had to end up kicking a field goal. But it felt like after that initial drive, you were like, okay, maybe, maybe it'll be competitive this week. And then – Things just became a complete disaster. <laughs> on, just got on, out of hand. Yeah, on all sides of the ball after that. So, like, like I said, getting back to a topic, was that the worst Jaguars game you've watched? Because for me, I'm not sure if it is, but it's definitely in contention. Because, I mean, 
j- just the fact that, you know, I was there to report on the game by, by halftime, you know, halfway through the third quarter, I can basically knock out my story because there's nothing else going on, really. I mean, Phillip Rivers has having the worst year of his career, and he didn't even have to play the fourth quarter. I mean, that that's just – that's wild to me. So, I mean, w- was that the worst Jaguars game you've seen? Because I think it's at least top three for me, and there's a few others, you know, in contention. But it's it's definitely up there for me. I would say top three as well. And I think the only other two games that immediately come to my mind – is the 28-2 to two loss to open the season against Kansas City. And I think that was in 2012, I want to say. I, I'm, sadly, I know it was in 2013 because that was the first game of the Gus era. 2013, yeah. And, yeah. and do you know who the quarterback was for the Chiefs? Wasn't it Alex Smith? Was it Alex? I think it was Nick Foles, wasn't it? No, nah, no. Nah, Nick Foles actually beat the Jaguars in a different year. <laughs> his, only win, oh. his only win as a Chief, he beat the Jaguars in like a – like 17 to 9 or 17 to 10 Dude, game, something like that. I seriously thought Nick Foles was the quarterback of that team. No, nah, no. Nah, I, I, I'm, it was Alex Smith. And I, I actually think that was Alex Smith's first game with the Chiefs, too. And I, Not- I, I that's the game they start off. Like, the Jaguars get that really early safety and stuff. And then yeah. things just went downhill. <laughs> well, I mean, that was kind of very similar to this Chargers game. Yeah. Because, I mean – it looked fine, like the first offensive drive, like you said, you know, drive down, get the field goal, and you're like, ooh, maybe this might not be so bad. Yeah. But the uh, the other game that I would say, and this one's probably the worst game. Okay, actually, I put the Chargers in the top four. So I think the two worst games I've seen the Jaguars play is when they lost to Tony Romo in London. I think that was – I mean, not Tony Romo in London, when they lost to Colin Kaepernick. In the 49ers. Okay, yeah, in the 49ers in London. London. Yeah, that was a bad one. That was terrible. Yeah. And the second one was when they lost to the Cowboys last season. When yeah. they dropped, I think it was like 55 points. Yeah. Yeah, and or something. Uh, but both of those were really bad. Uh, I mean, the, the Jaguars 49ers one, that one was also in 2013. That, like, like this week's game was 45 to 10. That one was 42 to 10. And just like looking back on it, it like Colin Kaepernick, he only had to throw, what was it like? I'm looking at now, 16 passes, and they ran the ball 42 times. Like they were literally just trying to run the clock out that game. But I, I, I remember that game well. Uh, Jaguars were 0 and 8 after that game, so they had still not gotten a single win under Gus. And just going to London to play a 6 and 2 49ers team with basically an expansion roster on your side and a first year head coach that that is just not asking for any good things to happen and I think that's why people could make the argument that this Chargers game was the worst because I mean even even the Cowboys game I think the Jaguars were still like outmatched you know and they were definitely outmatched against the Niners but like the Chargers that was a game that they were in and involved in and you know were pretty evenly matched I don't think by any means was this a game that the Jags should have lost by that many points? Yeah, yeah, and, and here's my thing. With, with the games, like the Chiefs game and the 49ers game, like you said, the, the roster was just not going to compete at all. I mean, and they, they got the doors yeah. blown off of them. And same thing happened when they played Seattle in 2013. They absolutely got the doors blown off of them like they did on Sunday. But like you said, they, they were never going to compete with those teams. That's why I, I, I think I agree with you. I think the two worst I've seen, at least recently – or the Chargers won this year and the Cowboys won last year. I'm not sure which one I feel like is worse because I feel like you can make an argument for each based on this. When it happened against the Cowboys last year, the Cowboys were a playoff team last year. They were a solid team. But the Jaguars returned most of the you know cast from that 2017 playoff run, and especially the entire defense, and they still got a 40-burger put on them. So that that was wild, just seeing how a, a defense that was stacked with Pro Bowlers at every level got really destroyed by a Cowboys offense that didn't even pass for 200 yards. They just made it look easy when they had to. But the reason I think this Chargers game is probably the worst I've seen is, like you said, the Chargers came into this game at 4-8. and eight. They, 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 It's not like they, were, they are a good football team. They came in as a 26th ranked scoring offense and they put up 45 points like it was nothing they, they, yeah. they, they threw a touchdown with a backup quarterback I mean that the quarterback is having the worst year of his career easily easily 
and he doesn't even have to play the last quarter. And he and he threw six incompletions, and three of those were throwaways at the end of the first half. I mean, yeah. it, 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 if the Chargers were, like, say, like, a playoff team or even, like, a slightly above average team, it would make more sense. But this is a mediocre team that just came in and blew the do- absolute doors off of Jacksonville. That's what makes it such a bad game to me. Yeah, and – Philip Philip Rivers, man, like they he need he needed that. Like it's it's so weird. Like he needed a game like that to have another chance in the NFL because you know he's a guy like you know like the Tom Brady's of the world and the, I think Eli Manning he's a free agent this year. You know like these older quarterbacks that are basically going to be free agents next year that have been on like the same team forever. And it's like, if you want to make a case that you can be a starting quarterback somewhere, you need to have games like that. And Phillip Rivers had a game like that. But, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Like, did that game come down? And I, and I said this in my, my article about, like, what we learned. Yeah. It was hard for me to pinpoint it on something exactly. Mm-hmm. What, was, that, was that a game that you think just the players that were on the field just weren't matched up well yeah. or coaching? Yeah. Or what do you think? I think one, they were out schemed offensively versus defensively because uh, it seemed like the Chargers knew every Jaguars call that was coming for them. But on, I think the big thing was one team was way more talented than the other, and that's wild yeah. to say because the team that was more talented, once again, is right now a five and eight football team. They were eliminated from the playoffs despite winning this week. They're not a good football team. But they look like the 1985 Chicago Bears roster compared to the Jaguars. You know, I mean, I, I wrote an article, you know, uh, on this earlier this week, and I tweeted about it some. There's at least five to six guys playing big roles on this defense right now that really, by most NFL standards, shouldn't be. Four, four yeah. of them weren't even on the roster during training camp, you know, and Akeem Spence, Marcus, Gil- Marcus Gilchrist, uh, and, and there's a few others I'm forgetting. Then you got guys like uh, Donald Payne and Andrew Wingard that are now starting due to injuries. And that doesn't even factor in somebody like Quincy Williams, who uh, – Underperforming. I, yeah. As, ta- as physically talented as Quincy is, I think his first half performance on Sunday might have been the worst defensive performance from an individual player I've seen from a Jaguar. Like, I mean, the, like in, in totality. Because- it's up there because Quincy Williams was a guy that I was really excited for because, you know, all the news coming out of training camp was that he was balling out. He was playing really good football. You know, even in preseason, he looked all right. And then, you know, he comes in, he plays his first couple of regular season snaps, and he just was not as advertised. Like, it, like all these linebackers, you know, even Miles Jack, like to some extent, like when they come out and they play, they just look so confused. Like they just don't, they, they don't look like they're lined up right. You know, they're not tackling well. There's just, there's up and down this, this linebacking play has been terrible for the Jags. And I think has been probably the biggest reason why this team is struggling so bad defensively. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I'd agree with that for sure. It's definitely the weak spot of the defense right now. And, I mean, just, just you know, Quincy specifically from – he has struggled a lot with his discipline uh, in terms of, like, his eye discipline and his instincts uh, this season. You know, a lot of times you'll see him on the losing end of a play-action play or on the losing end of, like, say, or a verse. That happened constantly yeah. on Sunday. And it wasn't like he was just a little bit out of place. He was a lot out of place on a lot of plays. I mean, Keenan Allen had a 45-yard catch off play action on the Chargers' second play of the game that was due to Quincy biting on play action. Uh, Hunter Henry's 30-yard touchdown. Quincy, in that cover three call, Quincy, Quincy has to stay where he is at in the middle of the field and then carry that downfield route. For some reason, he went all in on uh, what looked to be like the setup for a screen at the line of scrimmage. He went all in on that, and Hunter Henry just ran wide open behind him. And uh, Qu- Quincy, they have not outright said it. Uh, nobody's really asked Coach Marone, so there's no reason for him to outright say it. But in the second half, Austin Calitro played a uh, will, line- will linebacker. That's the second yeah. time this season that Quincy's been benched. Uh, at some point during a game for performance. Uh, it happened against the Panthers when he got benched for Najee Good. 
This time he got benched for Austin Calitro. Uh, so right now he's getting benched for journeymen and, you know, career special teamers, you know. I mean, it's not like he's getting benched for any studs or anything. I mean, he's getting benched for players that legitimately aren't very good. So I, I, I think his big thing is he was really thrust into a role and thrown into the fire right away when he, he was literally having to be built from the ground up in terms of how to play linebacker. But I think just some of the things that he showed on Sunday, it, it makes you wonder when can that switch happen and if, you know, the light can really come on because it, it was a concerning game, man. And I, I, I think that kind of stuff between just the lack of talent on defense on Sunday and even on offense at spots, I think that was the biggest reason the game got out, so, out of hand so quickly. I, I, I just think, you know, Hunter Henry, Joey Bosa, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, they're just better than the players the Jaguars have right now, and that's because of a poor roster building over the last few years, especially since 2017. Well, and I mean, that's, Quincy Williams obviously needs to get better, and I think you hit the nail right on the head, and I think it's been constant with the Jags. I had this conversation with somebody on Twitter the other day, and I literally don't – Miami maybe. I said Miami would be a maybe, but there's like – not a lot of teams in like in the league right now that I would say the Jags would for sure beat. No, I, like, I, I, I think Miami would beat Jacksonville, dude. Yeah, see, like, and I can see that too because yeah. the thing is that the Jags have the most problems with is obviously the talent level on the defensive side of the ball. And the fact is, is that if you have one stud, if you have one stud on your team, mm-hmm. he will go off. The Jags, yeah. you know, it seems like, like they don't even – I, I said this like two or three podcasts ago. Like it, it seems like they don't even like study film because you look at the Chargers. You know who the Chargers have on offense. You know who the Chargers have on defense. Joey yeah. Bosa, I think, got two and a half sacks. Yeah. And then you got Austin Eckler had over two hundred all-purpose yards. Yeah, and- dude, e- e- Eckler two hundred and thirteen yards and twelve touches. Is that the most insane stat line you've seen? It was great for my fantasy team. Shout out to Austin <laughs> Eckler for uh, getting me past the first round of the playoffs. But, I mean, that is definitely the most insane stat that I've seen. And and who else who else to do it against with the Jacksonville Jaguars yeah. defense? I mean, when you know, you know they have these two running backs and you have to game plan for them, yeah. it's just, you know, it's, it's bad. And Austin Eckler and Melvin Gordon, I think, were the – key reasons why the Jags lost it. Phillip Rivers have a good game. Sure he did. But I mean, there was like the was play, easy. the Mike Williams touchdown was that was perfectly placed. Yeah. That like, was a great he, throw. He threw it right where he needed to put it. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that he was just, he was just throwing passes that, you know, Phillip Rivers hasn't been throwing like all season long, putting it, you know, right in the basket, right in the spot it needed to be. Um, I do think that, you know, Trey Herndon was in the, the right place where he needed to be, but that's just that's just something you can't stop. I, I was gonna say that's a play you can't even be mad at. You know, I mean, it, it, yeah. it was just a great throw and catch. But what's crazy to me is how often the Jaguars are a get right game for teams because, like you were saying, R- Rivers a few a few weeks ago his starting job was in question for Tyrod Taylor, and now he comes in here and he posts the best passer rating of his entire career. Uh, Mike Williams he hadn't caught a touchdown pass all season. That was his first that was his first touchdown all season. And, you know, who who else to get it against? And to your point, you know, you know the Chargers are going to use Eckley. You know they're going to use Gordon. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that the Jaguar scheme is too bland, especially against multi-running back teams. But here's my counterpoint. What could Todd Walsh realistically have done with the players that he had on defense? Because outside of, you know, a couple pretty good defensive linemen and A.J. Boye and Trey Herndon, who's – who's fine, that was that was just a bad defense in terms of talent that was out there. So and I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm just – I'm wondering what else he could have done because, I mean, when, when you're trotting Andrew Wingard and Quincy out there and Donald Payne, I mean, his hands are kind of tied, I feel like. I mean, I agree with that. But, you know, in like A.J. Boye too, I mean, he didn't have the best game. No, of, he's had two bad know, weeks in a row of his career by any means. I mean, like Keenan Allen was kind of going out there, beating him like a drum all day. And, you know, like you said, there, there really isn't that talent there. 
and there's not like that specific big play guy on the Jaguars defense, like in the secondary linebackers, you know, et cetera, yeah. that's out there that can make those kind of plays. And, and you're right in that aspect, but I mean, you still, you still want to see like some of these guys like step up and do yeah, right. something. Yeah, like it absolutely. just, it's so obvious, like, you know, absolutely. that, that these are players, you know, obviously that, you know, some of them are guys that you get off the street, but it's like, realistically can't you make like at least a couple of plays like you know like do something but you know they did like like philip rivers would drop back to pass and it's just like first down first down, yeah first down. like it yeah they made it look easy Could yeah do anything. yeah the the only drive they really showed any life on was that second drive on defense when uh calais got the third down sack other other than that the chargers it, it just looked so easy for them and that that that's what was wild I mean, because, you know, coming into the game, like we had said, the Chargers, they did not have – they had good pieces in offense, but they didn't have a good offense in terms of production. And, I I mean, Anthony Lynn even said after the game, like his opening line of his press conference was, uh, that felt good. It wasn't a nail-biter or, you know, something like that. Well, and that was another – that was another thing, too. Like, you know, we we talk about how, you know, Mike Williams has his first touchdown – pass and you know philip rivers throws the best you know qbr of his career and i don't know if you heard this on the broadcast but it was his 38th birthday i heard that like a million times yeah i i i I didn't catch that until i saw like chargers fans yelling happy birthday to him on the tv as the game ended uh, it's it was so bad and honestly i i i totally forgot what tangent i was going on what did you say again I, i mean just the fact that you know so like the Charger fans there at, at like the end of the game, they were basically so like bored and jubilant that they had a, a Chargers oh. defensive lineman like leading them and singing "Happy Birthday" for Rivers. Uh, I remember what I was gonna say now. So, so you gotta, you know, like Philip Rivers does all that. Mike Williams catches his first touchdown, and then the Chargers, who are synonymous with just freaking losing games by like seven or less points, like all season long. And then who do they have the big game against that they drop 45 points against? The Jacksonville Jaguars, because why not? That's just, that's just the team that they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, was, it, it was just a bizarre game. And, I, I mean, it was kind of the cherry on top for where the season has gone and where these last five games have really gone. I mean, you know, we, we've heard it a lot since then, but Jaguars, this Jaguars team, they're the first team since the 1986 Bucks to lose – uh, five straight games by 17 points or more. Uh, that Bucks team went 2-14, and 14 and they were so bad that number one overall pick, Bo Jackson, refused to play for them. Just to yeah. put that into context, dude. Bo Jackson said nah for that Bucks team. That is the trajectory this Jaguars team is on right now. And I mean, to your point earlier, if you're just looking at teams in the last five weeks, the, the Jaguars are probably the worst team in the NFL just in these last five weeks. I mean, they have a negative 100, 112 point differential in these last five weeks. I mean, there hasn't been a single game they've been competitive in. You know, I mean, teams like the Bengals and Dolphins and Washington and the Giants, they're, they're, they're losing a ton of games, but there's been a few games where they're losing close. Uh, if for Jacksonville, it feels like a close loss would be like a major upgrade at this point. You know, yeah, it'd be like one of them Gus Bradley moral victories if the Jags went out there and lost by three. Yeah. You know, th- th- that that's what will that's what'll turn the team around. But but I agree with that <laughs> because it's just it's it's been so difficult to watch. And and I always think too like, I, do you think this would be different if it came at a different point of the season? So like say, like the first five weeks of the season mm-hmm. when Minshew comes in. And he's a six round rookie. And he like say he played like a six round rookie. Mm-hmm. And the Jags lose those five games in a row. Do you think the the vibe around the team would be different? Do you think they'd still be obviously, you know, being as upset as they are now, calling for all these people's heads? Or do you think yeah. that Yeah, I do. Cause I, I, I think whenever you have a stretch like this where you look like you don't even belong in the league as a team compared to the other teams, because I mean Three of these five teams they've lost to by so many points are below 500 right now. So not even losing the good teams. They're getting yeah. blown out by straight-up mediocre teams, you know. 
the Buccaneers, Chargers, and Colts. None of those teams are what you would classify as a good team, but they've all been able to dominate, you know, Jacksonville. And I, I, I think you have that stretch at any point in the season. I think people are going to be calling for changes, uh, especially with a lot of the expectations coming into this season. Uh, I, you know, me personally, my call before the season was 6-10, uh, and 10, but I know a lot of people had high hopes for this season and thought even maybe a return back to the playoffs. So I, I, I think you have a stretch like this at any time, and people are going to be, uh, you know, upset. But I think the fact that it comes – after the Jaguars were four and four at one point, uh, you know, with Minshew, that hurts I, the most, I think. yeah, I, I, I think that's what I think that's what makes it sting for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just wild that that, that they haven't won a game since week eight. You know, it, 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 it was October. I, I should know a date off the top of my head, but I don't. But it was October like twenty fifth or twenty sixth. That was the last time they won a game. You know, I mean, we're we're getting up there to almost two months since they won a game, <laughs> and that that is just that is just wild to me because this was supposed to be the easy part of their schedule too. You know, I mean, the tough part of their schedule was that first half, and that's when they went four and four. And th- this and was this, yeah, yeah, this was supposed to be when they were able to get going, and the opposite has happened. For I mean, there, there's obviously reasons for it because of injuries and stuff like that, but I don't think there's a reason they should be as uncompetitive as they are right now, if that makes sense. I, I'd agree with that hundred percent. And I, I, I don't, I just don't even think, I, I think, I think I've seen a lot of power rankings today. Yeah. And a lot of them have the Jaguars ranked at 32. And for me, that's hard to argue. And like you said, yeah. you know, they play like they straight up don't belong. And I think as of right now, the Jacksonville Jaguars are the worst team in football. Yeah, and it, 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 it's hard for me to really, I mean, disagree with that. Just, I mean, it, if you're talking about on the whole course of the season, have they been the worst team this year? Of course, the answer is no, but over these last five weeks, are they the worst team? Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. And, I mean, that, that brings me to my next question. I mean, do you think they win another game this season? And Absolutely. They, they only have three left. Absolutely not. What's the point? What's the point? Like, yeah. I mean, it looks like like in that forty-five to ten loss, you know. And I mean, we we've, we've talked about it. You know, the talent obviously isn't there on the defense. There's injuries. You know, the Jags are the most penalized team in the league, so there's penalties, obviously. But it just looks like a team that's completely defeated. And I think after they lost those, because the biggest stretch for the Jags, you know, for of the season was the Houston, Indy, Tennessee games. Yeah. And they lost all three of those. And I think after they lost all three of those, they kind of, they kind of figured, you know, what's there to play for? We don't have much, you know, there. So, you know, I think they're they're tanking. You know, I don't think purposefully they're gonna go out there and tank. I don't I don't believe that unless you're like Miami to start the season. Yeah. I don't I don't believe that teams go out there trying to lose, but I think this is a team that doesn't have enough talent. Does isn't well isn't coached well enough and has way too many problems and looking at the three teams they have left I don't think they win. Yeah, I I don't think they win another game either. And you know, uh, Marone actually said something on uh, yesterday on a conference call that I think kind of summed things up. You know, he was like, when you look at the tape, we're not a team that's playing with confidence right now, and we're not coaching with confidence. And I'd agree with that. They're a team that plays like they know they're going to lose the game from the very first snap. Uh, yeah. I, I think their confidence is completely shattered by this losing streak. I think any momentum they had, any you know positive th- feelings they had, I think all those are gone at this point, strictly because of how bad this last month or so has been. I'd agree with that 100. percent And and I seen the the line for the for the Raiders game and the, yeah. the spread. Yeah. And the Raiders are favored by six and a half. I would bet the mortgage that they yeah. cover Lock that. Lock it. And Lock more. it. If if I had a kid with a college fund, I, I would drop every cent of it in, <laughs> into that game. Me too. And yeah, it, it, I, it. I just don't see any way that in the Raiders' last game in that stadium that they lose to a Jaguars team that's experiencing probably its worst stretch as a team ever. Well, and and it's funny too because one of my uh, shouts out to Bo if he's listening, but one of my friends' uh, dad is going to that game. 
And this is when we were on the four and four streak. I was telling him, I was like, dude, Nick Foles is going to be out there and he's going to dominate. And, you know, look at, look at how, how that's, that's turned out. Yeah. 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 You, got the, <laughs> you got the Raiders, you got Atlanta. You know, another, another screwy thing that this probably isn't something to actually take into consideration, but yeah. the Jaguars have played so many more games like towards the end of the season at, you know, four o'clock or one o'clock, like the afternoon games, man, that's just been. That's yeah. been a dagger. And they, yeah, they no. play the Raiders at one and in the West Coast, too, no, nonetheless. And, you know, the Jags struggle on the West Coast every time. They got Atlanta. <laughs> not, no way. Yeah, no, no I, I think especially, you know, with the Atlanta's not a good team by any means, but they've at least shown the ability to beat bad teams. I, I don't think the Jaguars get a win there because, again, I think, Atlanta is just more talented than Jacksonville is. And then they got the Colts at home in week 17. And I, I'm going to go with the Colts in that one because I think the Colts are going to be able to do what they did earlier this year and basically just take the game out, out of Jacoby Brissett's mediocre hands and put it into the, into the you know, running back in the offensive line and tell them to dominate Jacksonville's bad front seven. And uh, then offensively, I, I could see Jacksonville actually putting up some points in that game they're going to put up points in any but I, I i'm with you i i just don't see how anybody can pick them in any of these last three games i i honestly think atlanta is going to get out of hand really quick i think i think atlanta is going to be very similar to the chargers game i think matt ryan like throws for like 300 yards and like they just they just shut us out. Like they're gonna drop yeah. forty on the Jets. Yeah, I mean just Matt Ryan and Julio Jones alone, I think are gonna have big days that day. And then uh, Grady Jarrett, I mean they, they they just have a number of guys. I think you know could really hurt Jacksonville. That you know that should be the most winnable game left, but for some reason that feels like the one I'm least optimistic about. You know that that they win, but. I, I think we're on the same page here. And, I mean, if, if they don't win another game, you know, they're going to end the season 4-12. and 12. Uh, Last year they went 5-11, and 11 and uh, owner Shad Khan gave a pretty strong statement at the end of the season that uh, he wouldn't really put up with another season like that. Uh, it, it's Tuesday night right now as we're recording this, and so far no changes have been made to the coaching staff, the front office, anything like that. So, uh, what, I mean, why do you think changes haven't been made, and when do you think they actually will be? Uh, to be a hundred percent honest, like, what's what's the point? You yeah. Know, like, yeah. I just, I just don't see the. You're not reason. changing anything. Yeah, I don't see the reason behind why, like, why do this now? You got three games left, like, you know, then you're gonna have to go through the process of like, who's gonna be the interim this, who's gonna be the interim that for like the last three games of the season. And, I mean, in a situation right now where you're in a way where you're not going to probably win these last three games, that's just going to improve <laughs> improve your uh, draft pick. So, it's like you might as well keep around these garbage coaches and, and just hope that, you know, maybe that it'll help you lose and you'll get a yeah. better draft pick at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think – like you said, any, like, firings they make. Like, I, I went on record on Sunday saying I thought that Todd Walsh would get fired this week. I wasn't, like, reporting that, you know, oh, sources say Todd Walsh going to get fired this week. No, I was just saying I think he is because I don't see how they keep him after a defensive performance like that. Uh, it, if they're keeping him after that, I can't imagine they're changing anything these last three weeks. And, I mean, really because, like you had said, it won't change anything. Like, well, you're going to hope somebody, I guess, has a new message. I mean, maybe it helps the defense play a little better if somebody else is out there making the calls, but it doesn't change the fact that they don't have much talent on that side of the ball. And, I mean, if you fired Doug Marone, who exactly are you asking to, you know, step in for these last couple of weeks? Uh, I've seen a lot of people say John Filippo. I don't think the Jaguars would do that to him. I, I don't think that they would say, hey, you know, you're a guy who wants to be a future head coach. Your first head coach opportunity, I'll be an interim one, is going to be of one of the worst teams in the NFL. I, I really do not think they would do that to him. So I, I, I think that they're going to play out these final three weeks because if they weren't going to fire anybody after the end of that game, I don't think they're going to fire really anybody at any point until the season's over. But, I mean, the more games stack up like this, the more and more I think – 
that um, wholesale changes are coming, including even Dave Caldwell. But I think all of that's going to be like Black Monday firings at, at this point. You know, if they weren't going to fire Todd Wash, Doug Marone, or anything like that after this 45-10 to 10 loss at home versus a bad Chargers team with a quarterback whose starting job had been called into question, I, I don't think they're firing them until the season's over. And I, I think the biggest reason they do that is probably because uh, Shad Khan has kind of said, you know, before he likes stability, he doesn't like to rock the boat too much. So I, I think he's going to let this uh, finish out and then, you know, take care of business the day after the Colts game. Do you think that it's going to be a situation where everybody that's going to get fired is going to get fired all in one day? Or do you think it's going to be like separated a little bit? That is – that's a good question. I think it'll probably be all in one day, honestly, because I think they're going to try to get a jump on getting a new regime in, whether it's uh, uh, getting a head coach first or getting the GM first and letting him pick his head coach, whatever like that. I, so I, I do think it's all going to be at once, especially since they haven't fired anybody yet. I mean, you kind of, I think, have to uh, get rid of everybody at once. Uh, it's just – I'm I'm the most curious – as to who they get rid of. Like, I, I just, I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, it has I, to be are you, two are you, minimum. I, I was going to say, are you, are you not sold that it's going to be all three? Because going into this game, I thought Dave Caldwell was going to survive and Tom Coughlin and Doug Marone would be gone. Right now, I think all three are going to be gone. I think as of right now, I think the only two guarantees, and it's, it's messed up, honestly, I think, the only two guarantees that they're going to be gone is Doug Marone and Todd Wash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't throwing Todd Wash in that, too. Yeah, no. Todd Wash, I think, is definitely gone. And, yeah, I mean, I, I understand why you say that. I absolutely do. I mean, I, I, I can see the front office, you know, making an argument that, hey, we had the pieces there, but the coaching staff uh, went against our wishes on quarterback, yada, yada. They didn't, they didn't use our players in the right way. So, I mean, I, I could definitely see that especially for uh, how we know the team feels about Tom Coughlin, how much they value his opinion and respect him. But I, I, I just think after this stretch that they're going to go for, you know, sweeping changes. And I, I've been wrong plenty of times before, but I, I feel pretty confident in saying that at least, at, at minimum, Tom Coughlin, Doug Marone, and Todd Wash uh, will be replaced at the end of the season. I'd I'd like to see Tom Coughlin get replaced, but um, yeah, it's it's weird because you know Dave Caldwell was a guy that you know during the off season the last couple of years is somebody that the Jags fans have been very vocal about you know wanting gone, but now it seems like he has the most secure job in the building. Yeah, yeah, I mean I, I I'd agree with that for sure, and it's it's kind of weird honestly how that yeah. came about because it's not like it's anything that is deserved off of merit or good work or anything like that, you know? It's just off of, like, people turning their backs against Tom Coughlin, I'd say. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I think we're in agreement there. I mean, uh, you personally, would you have made any changes at this point? Uh, Me personally, I would have at least fired Todd Wash at this point. Not that I think it would change many things, but just to – kind of save face and space and show people that you care enough to make changes. But that's the only one I really would have made at this point. Cause I mean, like, like you said, it doesn't really matter. I, I would fire Doug Marone. If I thought there was somebody who could kind of, you know, maintain the ship for the last few weeks as interim head coach. So they could get a jump on a head coaching search. And even though an interim head coach isn't that important, I think you at least need somebody in there who knows what they're doing. And I just don't think they have that. You know, I mean, they had that when they fired Gus Bradley because Doug was a former head coach. They they don't have that right now. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I personally uh, probably yeah. not. Probably not. I probably would would keep everybody in the building just because, you know, like I said earlier, what are you going to do? Like, you, you, there's not really anything that's going to change anything. You know, the talent on the field in itself isn't that great, yeah. like we've established earlier. And, you know, Todd, Todd Wash is bad. And don't get me wrong, like, I think he should get fired at the end of the season. I don't think he deserves his job one bit. 
but I mean, you might as well, you know, let it finish out. And you talk about like with the coaches not coaching with confidence. I mean, you see that man, like I've, I've only seen videos of like Doug Marone, like in the press conference and stuff, but he looks like a guy that is just going out there knowing he's going to get fired and is just like there to collect a paycheck at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I don't even think it's that, but you know, they're just going out there and trying to just collect a paycheck and they don't care. I think they care. I just think they know that they're basically powerless to changing anything because yeah. I mean, they've already tried to make so many changes you know, personnel wise, they, they've even changed the quarterback. I mean, they, they've done everything they can realistically do inside the season, but reinforcements are not coming. You have to, you know, lay in the bed you made. You have to cook with the groceries that you bought, and they just cannot make it work. And I, I, I think that they have realized that they can't make it work and that they honestly feel kind of helpless and powerless. I mean, at least that's the energy I get from the press conferences. Uh, Maroon was especially somber uh, this uh, this past uh, game, this past press conference, even more so than he was after the Tampa Bay game. And it, it just had the feel of a guy that he, he knows his time is uh, almost up, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think – I think that's that's kind of just the vibe in the locker room for, you know, not only the coaches, but I mean, some of the players. And and it it, it makes it so hard because, you know, Yannick Ngakwe, who's a guy that, you know, everybody wants to pay him and we should have paid and they should have paid them him earlier than yeah. now. You look at Yan right now, if I'm Yannick Ngakwe, I don't even want to be here. You know what I mean? Like like this the losing side of things I think has hurt Yannick and Gawkwe staying in Jacksonville I, I, even I, more. I was gonna say if you're Yannick and Gawkwe, do you wanna do you wanna resign in Jacksonville? No, not at all. I mean I just I don't think that there's any reason for him to stay. So you know you talk like people talk about all the time like are the Jags ever gonna sign Yannick and Gawkwe? Are they ever gonna sign Yannick and Gawkwe? I really don't think so. I yeah. don't I do not think so. Yeah. I, I, if you're Yannick Ngakwe, you're one of the best pass rushers in the league. What, what do you have to gain from being in this team? You know. Yeah. No. For sure. For sure. I mean, and I, I, I get the sense that Unique loves loves playing in Jacksonville. That he loves the fan base. He loves his teammates. But if I'm him, I'm a young and ascending pass rusher. Somebody is going to pay you in the NFL. You know. I mean, some team is going to. Uh, p- people keep you know questioning if the Jaguars. Uh, should pay Yannick Ngakwe. Some team is going to pay Yannick Ngakwe the money that he wants. He is going to yeah. get an absolute bag from somebody. I, I don't see any reason the Jaguars should not make it them because you have so many holes that why would you, you know, really uh, kind of create an additional hole for no reason whatsoever. But, I mean, it, here we are. And if they tag Unique, he doesn't really have much of a choice unless he wants to sit yeah. out that year. But, yeah, if, if, if I'm him, I'm, I'm honestly thinking along the lines of the same thing that, that we're talking about. And I, it, it, it's just a tough position, you know, for them to be in. Uh, and that, that, they, they, got, they got a lot of decisions to make uh, in these next few weeks. And it really just seems like these weeks are kind of, you know, uh, delaying the inevitable. Because we know what's coming. It just – we have to get through another 12 quarters of football first. I mean, and, and you know, getting to that point, um, I, how does this Jaguars team compare to past teams, especially, uh, you know, these past few years, like the Doug era, just in terms of disappointment for you? You know, honestly, I would say – I I think I think just – knowing that the product on the field is bad before you really step into the building kind of puts a little bit of a band-aid over 2019 but i honestly think 2018 was a little bit more disappointing for me yeah. personally because that was you know the year you're coming off this afc championship you just paid Blake Bortles it's supposed to be your franchise quarterback and you know all these guys get injured and you go 5 and 11 like i think last year from an expectation standpoint was more disappointing i think this year was more frustrating cuz i was like you i was a little bit more 
realistic with the Jags this year. I, I said seven and nine. I thought the Jags were going to go seven and nine this year, six and ten, somewhere around there. And, you know, they're going to probably end up going four and 12, five and 11, something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. disappointing from an on the field standpoint that they're putting up stats that are historically bad. And that's what's frustrating. But I would say from a perspective of expectations, I'd say 2018 was more disappointing. Uh, I think this season kind of felt like a, like a, like a 20, like a 2016 Jags team when, you know, they had like Allen Robinson, Allen Hearns, you know, who, who had, uh, yeah. you know, that potential to be great, to be good, but you know, they didn't end up being good. And I think that's, that's kind of the same vibe I'm getting from the 2019 Jaguars. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, I mean, I, I think in terms of how they're playing right now, they're playing worse than last year's team did and stuff like that. But I didn't come into the season, like I had said earlier, thinking they were going to make the playoffs or anything. Last year, I, I didn't think they were going to go far last year in the playoffs because despite Blake Bortles playing well at the end of 2017 and getting that contract extension, I w- never once was on the Bortles train. I thought that that was going to blow up in their faces one way or another, probably in the playoffs when things got tough. Uh, as it turns out, they never even sniffed the playoffs and then th- th- this year, you know, I, I like you, I just – I didn't have a ton of high expectations for them win-loss-wise. So, I probably agree with that. You know, I see a lot of people saying this is one of the worst seasons they can remember. And I, I think in terms of just – I think that's a little bit of recency bias just because these last five weeks have been so bad. But I, 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 I was just on the other side of the fence from a lot of people in thinking this season was going to be a positive one to begin with, because if you had told me at the beginning of the season that the Jaguars are going to be 4-9 at one point, I, I would have been like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah same I, I, here, I, same I believe here. it. And if you had told me in week eight when they were 4-4 four and four that they'd be 4-9, that's when I'd be surprised, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think we're on the same page there. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a rough one. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. I, there's no real way to spin it, no matter – how a lot of people try. I mean, you know, I, I, I do a winner and uh, I do a winner and losers article um, each uh, each Monday after games, just to try to talk about okay, what what are some of the big positives uh, from this game? What are some of the biggest negatives? I can only find two positives from, it, and that was Leonard Fournette uh, playing hard and getting to a thousand rushing yards. And then Logan Cook throwing a nice fake punt pass. And then outside of that, man, everything was bad. Which, which I don't know. I can't recall if it was this last podcast or the podcast prior. But I think I called that fake punt. Yeah. When I'm, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure. You, I, I know you've called one before. I can't remember which episode. But I know you've, you've said Logan Cook fake punt pass coming. So, eh, kudos to you. I did, dude. I, 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 when that happened, I literally was just thinking. I was like, I called that in a podcast. No one added me, though. But I definitely <laughs> called it. I all at myself. I, I mean, and, and I, I, I'll be honest. That was a better ball than any 2018 quarterback on the Jaguars. Did you see that? Did you see that finesse too on the? You know, you know, one player I really like, and I, and I shouldn't like him as much as I do because he doesn't really do that much. But mm. I really like Michael Walker. Yeah. I don't know why, but I like him. I was about to I, ask why. I don't I don't know what it is about <laughs> him, but I like him. And and every time, you know, he returns a kick or they're like, oh, it goes in the back of the end zone, Michael Walker. I just think of uh I think of Mike Sims Walker. So I just I always I always call him Michael Sims Walker. So I think <laughs> I think that I think just the name in itself is why yeah. I like him. But but yeah, that's that's a guy the Jaguars could definitely build around as Michael Sims Walker. But <laughs> Logan Cook is a future quarterback as well. Yeah, hey yeah, man, he I mean he he's a lefty too, and he 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 put a spiral on that ball. So I mean, hey, pro- props dude, shouts to out to Cook. lefties. I'm a lefty too. Shouts out to oh, lefties. That's gross. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, I I, I think we've uh, given our eulogy to what what the Jaguars uh, season has been to this point, and what this last disaster of a game was. So I, I, I think we can get into Twitter questions now. We, we've gotten a good bit uh, this week. So thank you guys again, as always, for, you know, interacting with us and sending us your questions. I really appreciate it. I know Treve appreciates it. And 
just the fact that you guys listen each week and are willing to give us your questions to talk about. I, 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 it just means a lot to us. So thank you. And I mean, we'll start off first with uh, my man, Brian, BCC one, uh, Brian with big cat country, really great guy writes good articles. He said, if we accept the qualifier of we build, even in its softest form, how many years do you see it taking to make this team competitive enough to be playoff caliber? Or is there enough talent that coaching can extract, can extract that quality right away? I think they, they're at least two years away from being a solid team if things go all the right way. Because I think at this point, this roster needs a whole nother year to add pieces to it before it can really be competitive. I mean, what, what's a year? I, I, that's such a hard question. I've seen that question before, you know, we went on. This is a yeah. team that, other than 2017, hasn't been competitive for like a decade. So, you know, you see the pieces come together in a 2017 year and the Jags go to the playoffs and you think this is the team that could finally do it. And then, you know, to ask how long is, cause is it going to take for this team to be, you know, overall competitive? That's a tough question because you got guys like, you know, is Gardner Minshew going to get a try in 2020? Are they going to trot Nick Foles back out there? Are they going to try and draft a guy? You know, what's the – what are they going to re-sign Yannick and Gokwe? I think there's just so many factors that go in to like what the Jags are going to do that I think it's hard for me to pinpoint an exact duration yeah. of when this team's going to be. Competitive. For sure, and, and I, what, what I would say to that is uh, the Jaguars coming off of 2016, entering 2017. I don't think anybody, even the most optimistic fan, thought they were going to be good that year. So, I mean, they they were able to turn that around in a year, and then it all came crashing down very quickly after. So, I mean, the the NFL, it's just fickle. It's hard to predict. But my my prediction is two years until you see them. Like, 2021 is when I see them being a solid team again, and that's if they make the correct moves. And a lot has to be seen until then. But uh, we'll move on to the next question from uh, Joe at Jag082. He said, how do you keep watching? Well, Joe, th- th- this is a humble brag. I-, I get paid for it. If if you aren't and you're putting your own money into this and your own emotional investment, I am so sorry. And I, I cannot <laughs> give any advice to how you keep on keeping on these last three weeks. I've had countless people tell me that they've stopped watching for the first time in their lives. And I, I-, I understand. Unfortunately. I don't I don't have I don't have that kind of flex like John has but you know John deserves it. Shout out to John. But what keeps me going is this awesome podcast and the work schedule that I have to where I only talk about the Jags once a week as opposed to talking about them for 6 days a week on my YouTube channel. And what also keeps me going is that no matter how you know pessimistic I get and how down I get on this team every Saturday night I go to bed thinking maybe we'll win. And yeah. it's still, you know, watching the Jags win still gives me like energy. Like, yeah, I, I, and I, this, this is going to be real deep real quick, but I, I've had like a conversation like with my, my friends like the other day. I was like, why am I so emotionally invested in sports? And I think it's good to be emotionally invested in something. And unfortunately for me, because I like pain and depression, I decided that I'd get emotionally invested into the Jacksonville Jaguars. So I think yeah. that that emotional investment in the fact that, you know, I really, you know, when they win, it feels like, you know, you win. When they lose, you know, it feels like you lose. And, you know, I, I try to put on more of a professional front, but, you know, the the fandom is definitely still there. Yeah, no, and I understood for sure. I mean, you know, back, back when I was watching them in 2013, 2014, I was the same way. I mean, no matter how bad they were, I, I wasn't missing a game. So I, I completely understand the people that go in there week in and week out and continue to watch. I also understand those of you who have been strong enough to say, I'm, I'm going to change the channel <laughs> this Sunday. I understand well, I both think sides. I think another easy thing for me is that I don't live in Jacksonville. Yeah. So I don't like, um, I don't really buy tickets to the game. So personally, I'm not investing my own money into it. You know, I just watch it on Reddit or Hulu. So it's like, for sure. 
what else am I going to do? You know, I'm yeah, not going to watch the for Seahawks. Sure. But... For sure. De- definitely different if, you know, you, you have to shell out, like, your actual, like, physical cash to be there in person each week and they're performing like this. Okay, next question. Uh, Ryan Day, a good, good friend of mine uh, over at Big Cat Country also. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, Ryan eats cake. Uh, horrendous treater. Uh, well, well, not mince words there. Just a terrible account, but good guy. Uh, he said, <laughs> if Tua and Derek Brown are available when the Jaguars pick, who are you taking and why? Uh, it, it depends on Tua's medicals. If, if Tua's healthy and they say he's good to go, there's no long-term worries. As much as I like Gordon Minshew, I'm pulling the twig- trigger on Tua, and I'm saying, let's ride. We have a franchise quarterback for sure. But that, that's just me. If there's any doubt whatsoever about his medicals, I'm saying Derek Brown and pulling the trigger there. Otherwise, I'm going to. Um, I'm taking Derek Brown, and uh, it's because I'm a Gardner Minshew stand. I refuse to. Yeah, are you? Have to a to a Tagalayova <laughs> in, in the building because Gardner Minshew for starter for 2020. Stay tuned for that at the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I completely I completely understand that. I just I I, I want to be sold a little more in Gardner. Before, and and I get that, on, and I get that, and on a Tua, yeah, I get that, and it comes, it comes down to like, and 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 I shouldn't, you know, we we just had like a long conversation about me being emotionally invested, but you know, I shouldn't have so much personal feelings in there, but it's so crazy to have like covered Gardner Minshew like for the paper here and seeing him lead a Washington State team to the best record and like their program history, taking them to a, you know, bowl game. He didn't get to go to the Rose Bowl because, you know, WSU never beats a UW. And they, you know, he literally took that team from the dirt and rose it up. And I just – I think with given some talent around him, I think just with his character and how he is as a man and a player, I think he can do that with the Jaguars. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't put it past him at all. It's just – the fact that you're passing on a guy for him much in the sense that they were passing on other quarterbacks because they had hope that Blake Bortles could be that guy. I get not that. to compare, I get Min- that. not to compare Minshew to Bortles because I think rookie Minshew is already infinitely better than Bortles was at his best. Uh, I'll go down swinging on that. Any Bortles stands uh, the at is underscore John underscore Shipley. He was never <laughs> once good. <laughs> I mean, but I, I just I, – I think when you're not 100% positive about your quarterback, then you don't have a quarterback. And I, I, well, yeah. I, I think that's when you take a chance. That makes a really confusing quarterback room, though, because, I mean, if Foles is still around yeah, and, he, and you draft that, Tua and you got Minshew, that makes things a little confusing. Yeah, it does. But if you're a new regime, I mean, what do you care about yeah. Foles? You know, I mean, yeah, you got his contract on the books, but do you care if he's starting or not? Because you, you can get rid of him after that year. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so. true. And 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 it's just personally, Joe Burrow's like the only quarterback in this draft as of now that I really buy. You know, it might it might take a I might be a little bit more convinced, you know, through the combine process and the whole draft process that's obviously coming up. As of right now, I'm a real big Joe Burrow guy. And oh I yeah. Think that, that he's the only one that I would buy, and he's obviously. Good. I will say, I would not take Justin Herbert at all. I, I would, no, no, I would rather have no. Gardner Minshew over Justin Herbert. There's no Stay way. Stay away all. from him, dude. Yeah, there, there's no way that would work out in Jacksonville's favor. I, I, I said that confidently. If if, if they take uh, if they take Justin Herbert, that it won't work out. And I, if yeah. that comes back to bite me, and they take him, and he becomes the first franchise quarterback since Brunel, or maybe even ever by most standards, then I will dig up this episode and I will blast it on my Twitter every day. But I, I just feel confident that Herbert is not, especially to his team. So um, I don't think he – I haven't bought – dude, when he was supposed to come out last year, man, yeah. I was very vocal. And I don't be- like was, his game. And he was better last year. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with you. I, I take Tua or Burrow right now, only if Tua's healthy, though. If, if, like, there's even a little doubt about his long-term future, then I'm, I'm taking Derrick Brown because I, I, I love Derrick Brown. I'm not taking any – other non-quarterback in this draft specifically for the Jaguars over Derek Brown because I think he's exactly what they need. All right. Uh, next question uh, from 
let me see, J-M-B-A-Gay at uh, Payon91. He said, would you rather hire someone with experience like Ron Rivera or hire a rising prospect like Byron Leftwich for next head coach of the Jaguars? Uh, I'd probably say they need somebody with some experience just because they're going to be coming into a situation that it's going to be a little bit of a rebuild and you're not sure how a, like a first time head coach is going to deal with that. A la Gus Bradley in 2013, but I, I can understand the argument for wanting a guy like Leftwich. Yeah. I, I think it would be so wild if Byron Leftwich came and coached the Jags. That would be so insane. But um, I'm, I've said it a couple times already on the pod. I'm a big Mike McCarthy fan. And, you know, there's been stories coming around that he's been like, like during this whole season, he's been, you know, studying trends. He's been trying to get to be a better coach. And I think like with a guy like McCarthy who has a resume like he has, if you bring him in and he's all in and he's been, you know, doing all this work to become a better coach, I think that's exactly who the Jaguars need. They need a guy that's been there before that has, you know, led a really successful team and a guy that wants to go out there and win football games. So I think Mike McCarthy is, you know, again, my number one choice. And here's something I've been thinking the last day or so, because I've seen all the things that you just talked about, the really good NFL Network feature on him and all that. If you're Mike McCarthy, you know, a lot of head coaches, they don't get third chances in the NFL or as head coach. You know, a lot of them get two chances, if that many. If you're Mike McCarthy – do you take your second chance on the Jaguars? Dude, that cements your legacy, man. If you come in to a team like the Jacksonville Jaguars and you turn this ship around, like that does a lot for you as a coach. Like that does a lot for him. And yeah. I think I, I almost like, I almost feel like a coach like McCarthy, who, you know, he has a lot of grit. He has a lot of, you know, love for the game of football i mean i think this is a this is a situation you want when you're coming back you well know, you don't you don't want to go to a team that's like extremely established you know you want to come to a team that you could really kind of build from the ground up and try and build a you know I mean, a winning team. what about like what about say atlanta if you're if you're a guy like mccarthy who's on a second chance would you rather atlanta or jacksonville I mean, I mean, from like a Mike McCarthy standpoint, yeah, probably yeah. Atlanta. But yeah, I mean. that's what, that's that, that's my only thing with McCarthy, dude. Because I I agree, I think he'd be a solid candidate and all that. I think he'd honestly be a lot of what they need. I'm just curious how much he'd actually be interested in it, and I I don't know that that's something that we're not gonna have answered for a while, if if answered at all at any point, because you never you never know, uh, you know, what guys they're interested in or anything like like that. But it's definitely, definitely a question I think that's worth asking. And, I, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see at this point. The, well, the, if you're the Jags, too, I think that this is the type of coach and the type of oh, guy yeah. that you've needed. Yeah. I think you go out there and you offer him the bat. I think yeah. you, you try and get him in. Like, you need to get a guy. Like, I, I'm, I'm, like, really sold on the fact that you need to get, like, an experienced coach that has, you know, experience winning. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I mean, I think just from the Jaguar side, you jump at the opportunity to at least interview him. My yeah. my entire thing is I wonder what his interest level is. And like I said, that, that'll be something that we, we find out soon enough because I'd imagine they at least give him a call. But I, I'm interested to see uh, what head coaches they at least uh, interview. So we'll see. All right, next question from you, Sailor 2. Why does it seem like Minshew doesn't target the middle of the field very often? Uh, he doesn't target the middle field very often, but here's my here's my counterpoint. Who is he going to target? Chris Conley uh, is not a possession receiver. He has bad hands. D.D. Westbrook is a really small guy, and if you throw him over to him over the middle, you might get him killed. They don't have any tight ends, and D.J. Chark is more of a vertical threat. Who are you throwing to over the middle? I mean, I've seen this post from, I think UCF Jaguar posted it. D.D. Westbrook's a tough MF, dude. Like, he he takes some hits, man. Like, for a small guy, like, going across, like, he gets leveled. And, I mean, you have more guys that are vertical threats. You don't really have a guy that you're hitting across the middle. And I I agree with you, like, everything you said. I, I, I just don't think they have that guy. They don't really have a tight end that they can do that to. They don't have 
a wide receiver except for Chris Conley who's been dropping balls lately. And yeah, I just I don't think they got the personnel to do that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, uh, ne- next question from uh, Dirk105, uh, Derek Gordon. What changes will be made on the offensive line? I do not think that they will change right tackle, center, or left guard. I think center, I think I think they're just going to keep Brandon Linder, especially next year because it's not like his contract is anything massive. I think Andrew Norwell, he would cost too much to replace, so I think the next regime will be stuck with him. And then right tackle, second year, Juwan Taylor, nobody's going to want to replace them. So I, I think either left tackle or uh, A.J. Can at right guard, I think that's where you're going to see changes along the offensive line uh, when, you know, when next season rolls around. Uh, I'm thinking I'm thinking along the same lines. I think, I think Cam Robinson's a good player. I think there's been times he's obviously struggled. I think he, the potential is there. So I yeah. think that uh, they should give him another round. But, I mean, A.J. Can's been a guy I've been vocal about replacing for a long time. So I think, I think this is finally, you know, his year to kind of, you know, get replaced and not be yeah. on the team. And, hey, and there's nothing like uh, replacing him a year after you just gave him a contract extension for some reason. But, eh, I mean, <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, ne- next question. Uh, Peruvian 881. Uh, y- y- y'all have some very interesting Twitter names. But, all right, he's <laughs> – with so many holes – uh, what do we address in the draft and what do we address in free agency? I think they go for a tight end and a linebacker in free agency and then go for the trenches and any of their other 1,000 holes during the draft. But I think they go for a guy like Denny Trevathan or a tight end like Eric Ebron come free agency. I I don't really know offhand, like the tight – I mean, the free agent list, and I don't really have them in front of me. But um, I think tight end and linebacker – are obvious. I think tight end and linebacker is something that the Jags should address in free agency. There's no really a reason to bring in like a rookie linebacker to no. try and yeah. you know learn the ropes like that. So I think I think linebacker and tight end are two vital positions. And you know a guy that hasn't played because of injury, but I think you know has some potential to be like a good two, a number two tight end. I think James O'Shaughnessy is a guy to watch out for next I, year. I, I, I do, too. It would just be interesting to see how he does coming off his ACL injury. But he, he was having he was having a good season before he got hurt, dude. I mean, 14 catches, 156 yards, and two touchdowns in about four and a half games. I mean, that that's better production than the rest of the tight ends on the active roster have now combined. So he, he was having a solid season. I, Gardner Minshew really liked him especially in the red zone. Their red zone was kind of started, honestly, after he got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. sure. All right, uh, next one. Uh, I, I'm I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this at. <laughs> it's like Mac Lock or it's, I, I don't even know. You know who you are. He said 2017 was the worst thing to happen to the Jaguars. Discuss. I disagree because you can't ever replace a playoff run like that especially considering what it did for your fan base after so many years of mediocrity. The worst thing that happened to the team was buying into the fallacy of Blake Bortles because you can have that playoff run in 2017 and be all happy and positive and still know that you need to upgrade your quarterback and have the courage and the forward thinking to do so. They did not. So buying into Blake Bortles was the worst thing that happened. So in a roundabout way, sure, 2017 – because it led them to believing in Blake Bortles. That was a mistake, but I, I think if they could do it over again, they would. I took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I have nothing else to say about that. Yeah, I'm, I, I've uh, – unfortunately, I've made this argument many a time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't put that any better. Yeah, all right. And and that was uh, the, the last of our questions. Uh, I mean, uh, Treeb, do you have any, like, at least – uh, you know, parting takes or anything else that you want the folks to hear. I mean, we, this has been one of our longer episodes. I mean, we've talked a lot. We've given we've given a lot of takes. I know me personally, I don't really have any hot takes because, you know, the four and nine they've lost five in a row by seventeen points or more. What other hot takes can we give? <laughs> That's the way I see it. So, I mean, do you have any parting ones? I got two, and neither one of them are Jaguar related because I uh, love doing that at the end of the show. Let's see. So. It. First hot take, and it's not even really a take, but it's 
Dave Batista should have been inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame years ago. Oh, yeah. Congra- oh, yeah. Congratulations to Dave Batista. Uh, they, they, they should have, and, and we're not going to get too off topic. They should have inducted Evolution as a whole. But go, go, go on with your next one. That that's true. That that has to be coming up. Yeah, that that was it, a great stable. And number two. And I got into a really heated argument about this today. So my ad on Twitter is Treep Talks, and you can come at me. Nicki Minaj is the best female rapper of all time. Uh, 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 I will go to war, John. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I love her monster verse, but outside of that, uh, I mean, so many number one hits. She's been on top for 10 years. I mean, yeah, you have a lot of number one hits. I mean, the Beatles had a lot of hits, but I don't think their music slaps. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll John, say that right you there. You just made a whole demographic. You made like, Yellow, everybody yeah. that loves the Beatles. <laughs> Yellow Submarine sucks. Oh. Yeah. John. I mean, the, the Beatles were not good. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've enjoyed – Ray Sherman way more than I ever have a Beatles record. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the Migos are the Be- are the Beatles of our generation. Yeah, I mean, Outkast infinitely better than the, than the Beatles. Yeah, Outkast for sure. I've seen the Migos live, which is an experience. Yeah, yeah. So, I, 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 if you had to compare, in my opinion, the Beatles to anything, they are the Jacksonville Jaguars from week nine to week fourteen of music groups. Oh, yeah, I that just, is going to get. Some Twitter interaction. Yeah. So now, I want. Go ahead. I wonder if more people are going to be upset if you're not liking the Beatles or me saying Nicki Minaj is a top ten female rapper of all time. Yeah, I mean, best fem- six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. <laughs> I feel like they're both pretty appropriate hot takes. I, 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 I've, I've angered a lot of people in the past with that Beatles take. Much, much like I have other takes of mine uh, about the Jaguars, but. That's why we're here. We're going to keep uh, continuing to give you all the takes. Uh, remember to keep reading Jaguars Maven uh, as the end of the season ramps up. We will be having head coaching candidate articles and all that for you. I just – and th- this answers to anybody who's been asking me questions. I want to wait till a little bit closer to the end of the season, but we will have all that kind of stuff. Until then, we have all kinds of other articles for you. We had one today on – how the last two free agency classes from the Jaguars have been so abysmal. So we we got a lot of stuff for you guys. We post daily. Uh, Tree does some game day articles for us that are really good. Uh, We're there at every home game. So make sure to follow us at Jaguar Maven. Uh, Go and read the site. And um, thanks again for listening to this episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast. And thanks again for supporting Jaguar Maven uh, in its infancy. Uh, I'm not going to get the full details right now, but I told the Jaguar Maven team earlier this week, we got really good news uh, in terms of how we've done with audience since uh, the inception of Jaguar's Maven. And th- that's nothing without the people that listen, the people that read what we write, all of that. So I just want to thank you guys, the best supporters and fans in the NFL. Uh, Tree, have you got anything else? Um, Jaguar Maven is going to be hot during the off season. I was wanting to say that during the podcast a lot because I mean, there's going to be oh, yeah. so many different articles for so many different situations. So, oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you guys are getting tired of the season, you stopped watching, make sure you tune into the Jaguar Maven podcast, you go to the Jaguar Maven site because the off season, I swear to you is going to be off the chain. So there's going to be a oh, lot of good content for sure. My boy, John's putting it on. We got a great team. And, uh, yeah, just thank you again for the continuous support and gang gang. And I I don't think I've said this on the Twitter handle. Uh, I'm going to be going to the Senior Bowl in Mobile. So so the Jaguar Maven will be over there for all your draft purposes, whatnot. So make sure to join us for the offseason. I know Andrew Dikeko, uh, another one of our contributors, he's going to try to go to the East-West Shrine game. So we're going to try to have a lot of draft content for you guys, interviews, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to uh, talking to you guys on the next episode of the Jaguar Maven Podcast.